Mbogi ya Maraitas from the Multimedia Library of the Alliance Française de Nairobi. Soyez les bienvenus. I have in my hands two slim volumes. One is called Phases of Life, a composition of poetry, and the other is called After Sunset and Other Poems. And they are both the handiwork of our guest, Benny Wanjohi. Welcome, Benny. Thank you. I'm excited about talking to a poet, but before we get into that very involved discussion, I'd like to ask you how it came about that you managed to get both these volumes published, copyright 2020, this year, the year of COVID. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so this is like what I've been doing, I think, in 2018, in 2019, of writing different poems and putting them together. And I post on my Facebook page, that's where I have most of my audience. And so when this year, there isn't much that was happening, and I decided, why not just put together my poems, uh, like in one book? And I, when I started the process, I realized that I actually had more that could fit in two books. And that's how the books came about. Okay, so you have, um, there are two anthologies here. Phases of Life has 36, what I would call, spiritual poems on 48 pages. And After Sunset has another 36 social poems on 54 pages. That is a total of 72 poems for the mathematicians watching on 102 pages. Is it right to say that therefore they are self-published? Yeah, that's very right. Um, self-published. Actually for both books they are self-published. I did the whole process. Yeah. <coughs> and how much do they cost? One goes for 400 each copy. Now tell me, if somebody wants to possess a copy, how do they go about it? Um, they can contact me on my phone number, which I'll give maybe at the end of the session. And they are also found at Prestige Bookshop and also at Textbook Centre. So you're saying to me that this is very much a Kenyan quotient. We can't read you in Accra or Ghana, for example. Yeah, at the moment uh, I'm not yet, uh, the books are not yet available on online platforms such as Amazon, uh, but that is in the process and hopefully by come next day, 2021, January, they will be available there in such platforms. Now, looking at the cover, I see at the back that there is a reference to you are a Kenyan writer who majors in poetry, you're a co-founder of Friends Who Write, a Kenyan writers group, and a poetry editor at Writers Space Africa. I'd like to hear more about Writers Space Africa and how it sort of slims down to become Friends Who Write. Um, Writers Space Africa and Friends Who Write are actually two different groups. Uh, for Writers Space Africa, it is a continental group that involves uh, bringing together, or it exists to empower writers, and specifically of the African continent. And our headquarters are in Nigeria, so we have subgroups that are scattered all across Africa in different countries. So we, we have several programs that we run. One of them is that we have a WhatsApp group. This is a safe space where writers share their words, and their works are critiqued by other writers, and they are helped to develop. And also another program that we have is the African Writers' Conference and uh, that happens every year since uh, 2017. And this year's conference happened in Zambia. And we also run other programs, for example, workshops that happen on online platforms such as Zoom and Facebook and such other programs. So Writers Space Africa 
exists to empower writers of the African continent. Coming to Friends Right, um, that uh, different group of writers that I also founded together with other friends. And we also come together. Apart from writing, we also do fun activities together. So what we say is that as, as writers, not only can we make uh, I mean, life easy so that we do not just major in writing, but you also engage in other fun activities. When we go out to different places, we also carry books, do book reading, and we also do writing together and help each other grow as writers. I'll put it to you, Benny, that poetry is the poorest cousin of the literary genre. I think that in Kenya in particular, we have a prize, the Jomo Kenyatta Prize for Literature. And unless my research is totally wrong, never has a poet been consecrated, nor for that matter has a playwright. Because the assumption is that the only writer who deserves to be called such is a novelist and works in prose. So is there such a thing as African poetry or are you just having fun activities in your club somewhere? Uh, yeah, I actually agree with your perspective about poetry and not having it having not been so much uh, appreciated in literary platforms. And um, what we, uh, like actually, um, one thing that we are seeing with poetry currently, especially in genres like spoken word, that is performed poetry, and also in written poetry, is that something that is really taking and finding its own space. Yeah, so in the past there might have been maybe things that happened, mistakes maybe, that happened that made uh, maybe by poetry or maybe in school, so that we do not have writers or even the audience <coughs> out there appreciating poetry, but um, it is finding its space, and hopefully maybe in the future, who knows. Another explanation for me, please. More and more, I, from my generation, I hear this emphasis on spoken word poetry, and people going out there and reciting, declaiming, and everybody gets rapturous and claps at the end. Are you a spoken word poet? I'm not a spoken word poet um, because spoken word poetry involves uh, a stage where you start and you perform to the audience. Uh, but I'm different. That's not what I do with my poetry. I write poetry and I post poetry to be read. So my poetry is more of being read and I observe the craft and the art of poetry that when someone is reading that's when they can get it. But for spoken word, it's more of I speak and you hear, and it's more of oratory. And so that's where the difference comes in. So w what is your response to this idea when you go to the spoken word is that every single time somebody's finished a poem, there is this idea of there is instant recognition it's a wonderful, there's cat calls, there's clapping, there's udilation, Benny, go, Benny, go. Can one be able to apprehend a poem in such a short time? Um, I would say even yeah, now. Yes, because for spoken word, it's more of direct in how it is um, articulated, in how it is conveyed for the audience, because it is packaged for the audience to add a third eight ten. But there is the aspect of poetry, which is called the hidden meaning, and that is mainly not found for spoken word. Of course, there are some spoken word artists too, who uh, observe that, uh, literally, uh, poetic device in their poetry, um, but mainly it's not. So it's the yes and no. Yes, it can be understood, depending on how it has been packaged, and no, if the spoken word artist has observed the hidden meaning device. Part of the plan is always to win awards. So we've got the Bert Award, and we're hoping that you might win the Booker. Are you writing to win awards? Have you won awards? In other words, do you have a name out there? Well, um, my poetry, I've never written with the thought of winning an award 
and I think that's one of the things that has made me never uh, participate in competitions, specifically poetry competitions, even outside there. Um, when I started writing, it was mainly to like speak hope outside there, and that's why I have the first uh, my, the faces of life book is more of a spiritual uh, book and speaking hope to the audience and so most of the themes that are there they go around the theme of hope um, yeah so for me it's never been hard it's always to convey uh, a message outside there so it's more of the audience and rather not going forward so there isn't an element of Luca here you're not in it for the money and neither are you making any money so it's still looking to me like a pastime. Money has definitely come in, for example, from the copies that I have sold here, and also from like what the bio that you read, being an editor also some comes with its own benefits. And you also asked something about the name. And yeah, like in the continental group, um, like I also do poetry lectures in the different subgroups of different countries. So there's much more to benefit just from, apart from recognition, which is there, and apart from money, and apart from inspiration. So it's a combination of, of all that. Money is there from the source of copies rather than what. Okay, in my own mind, I'm going to move on, and my rubric is your preparation for becoming a poet. Does the Kenyan educational system as it stands prepare one to become a poet? Where did you go to school? When did you encounter your first poem? When did you imagine that you might be a poet? Uh, well, on the Kenyan curriculum, preparing people to be poets, I think it does not. Because even for for poetry, it's not like a major lesson in high school, either in primary schools, maybe it's picked up as a unit in the university. Um, and, and, and actually, it is it, poetry is studied in high school as part of the of English and literature. And when you engage with most uh, students, it is still like it's a challenge to them when it comes to poetry. And so, um, uh, I actually didn't prepare to become a poet. Poetry about me. That is what I would say. And I would be different from my mind. The first time I interacted with poetry was when I was in high school and it was performance poetry, what is usually called in during high school music festivals, choral verses. So we were performing poetry together with a team, a group uh, of other students from my high school. Which I went to high school in Central Province. And so each and every year we would prepare, and it was an intense process where we always uh, use our evening uh, time after classes to prepare uh, for, uh, to, to perform that poetry. We had a, a trainer, and the trainer was also the poet who had done like, the poem that we were performing. And we would go from zonal levels to, um, then it was provincial level, there were no counties then, and then to the national level. And our school always got, got to the national level. So I would say, um, though then I was not really intentional about poetry, that was the first, those were the first platforms of exposure into poetry. Influences. Could you now recite some poem that has stuck with you since the age of high school? Um, okay. Yeah, I can, but I would have maybe to have a prayer preparation for the faith. Exactly, because I'm, I'm rather setting you up and saying, do you have any influences, or have you set about fabricating, as opposed to imitating? Normally the point of departure is this idea that we're going to imitate somebody because we really, really admire the way Shoyinka writes, or Shakespeare writes, or whomever writes. You never had that. But somehow, you, as we're going to discover, you wrote poems that seem to have a rhyme scheme. Where did that come from? Yeah, so as I had mentioned, in high school, during the English and literature classes, they 
a part of poetry that is usually uh, incorporated into, into the lessons. And so that's why uh, I learned. And there was a choral verse speaking. Yeah. As you said. Yeah. Okay, so you cannot cite any influences. So I would say my train of words and also maybe poems by Marjorie or Lupe, uh, especially at Chien Oyo, those are some of like a poem that is, I think, widely known as, I would even guess the most known poem in, in Kenya. So yeah, there was that influence, but not made any form. Well, it might interest you to, to know, Benny. Uh, Marjorie is a very good friend of mine and a mentor. One of the things that I wrote was, in fact, dedicated to her. And she herself thought that Ateno Yo wasn't uh, exactly a masterpiece. And she was somewhat ashamed of it at some point. But it's become what it's become. Uh, we've got Jonathan Carriara, I'm sure, and Grass Will Grow. Did you ever, were you ever exposed to And Grass Will Grow? Uh, not really. So you're not, you're not uh, Everett Satanda? Yeah. Um, but not really much, but I know, I know of him some of his poems. Good, because this is going to come back to haunt you, because I'm going to ask you what it is that informs your craft if there is no prior milestone that you refer to. But we'll, but we'll, we'll get there. What I would like to continue about your preparation is you went to high school and then you went to university. Um, the other trick question is, did you study literature at university? I didn't study literature, I actually studied something totally different. Is it a state secret? <laughs> no, that is a state secret. Well, um, I studied tourism management. Okay. Yeah. So you're the tourism manager who writes poetry. Yeah, we can as well say that. Right. I'm now going to ask... I'm going to suggest to you that you are a Christian poet and I want you to respond to that and I'm going to read to give our audience a flavour of the kind of poetry that you write in phases of life right at the very end you have a poem called An Apparatus and I'm going to read An Apparatus the pen must never relent to scribble hope on manuscripts. The voice must never be silent to speak hope in life twists. For these days of anxieties and moments of uncertainties, the God who knows no impossibilities shall guide them from all such insecurities, oh, sorry, shall guide from all such insecurities. Must write how he saves, how he heals, how he rebukes, how he delivers. It must tell how he blesses, how he moves, how he comforts, how he encourages. Are you a Christian poet? Yes, I am. Expand. Um, Why is the Christian poet any different from any other kind of poet? A Christian poet is a Christian poet because of two reasons. One, because they ascribe to the Christian faith. And secondly, if their art is also propagating the faith. Yeah, so for those two reasons, I consider myself a Christian poet. One, because I ascribe to the Christian faith, I believe in the values of Christianity advocated by the Bible, and I also do writing that is uh, about Christianity, that propagates the values in Christianity. Again, I would assume that any writer aspires to a certain universality, 
So in making such a declaration that you've pinpointed your audience, are you saying that what you have to say is of no worth to the Muslim, to the Hindu, to the agnostic, to the atheist? But yet, poetry surely is all about life and living and what we all go through. Why circumscribe yourself in such fashion? Well, um, as much as I'm a Christian poet, my audience is not specifically Christian, and I have friends who are also followers or readers of my poetry who are Muslims and also atheists. And actually some of the discussions in our interactions with them revolve around what I write. Like they want to know why do you write like what you write. But also something about Christianity is that some of the values in Christianity cut across. For example, the the, the virtue of I agree with life. You entirely. Yeah. I'm just saying that when I declare myself to be a German writer or a French writer or a it excludes those who are not part of the grouping. So why make that allegation? So, um, not necessarily so. It actually does not exclude them. However, um, because what I would call my walk of faith, it is something that I cannot drop. It's something that I have up, up held and something that I have to, to go with. And so, of course, there are some people who might be put off just by the fact that he is a Christian poet because they read my Bible and they see an aspect of Christianity. And that happens with art, even in an art exhibition, because poetry is art. It's not everyone who will appreciate that art, mainly because of its colors and all that. Someone might say, um, for light colors, someone might say, um, for dark colors. So there are always those exclusions that happen. A cross-cutting question. You start off because from where I'm coming from, 30, 35, 40 years uh, older than you are, I started off annotating your poem and I said the pen must never relent, A, uh, scribble on manuscripts, B, voice must never be silent, we're back to A, to speak hope in life, twist, we go B, so at school, I would have been told to say that the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. You then continue, anxieties, uncertainties, impossibilities, insecurities, and you sustain the A throughout in that verse. And thereafter, you totally abandon any effort at sustaining the craft of the poem. Is for you the message more important than the craft? Both are important, and um, sometimes when if you read more of the poems here, each poem has a different style well, of the craft that what we call style in poetry, like how you 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 put it down, how many number of lines do you put in every stanza, do you put a rhyme scheme, do you apply or not, and the message to some extent influences that. Uh, however, there is what we call the poetic license. Like, a poet must not always follow the rules. Like, yeah, poetry must always have rhyme. Like, traditional poetry must always have rhyme, must have rhythm. It must, it, it also observes metrical, uh, like, the metrical feet. Like, it must be in meter. However, when you apply the poetic license, you can deviate from that. It, you don't have necessarily to follow rhythm. You don't have to observe rhyme. And you can actually twist rhyme, like have rhyme on stanza one, like what I've done with this poetry, have rhyme on stanza two, and not on the other stanzas. So that comes. It was deliberate. It was very deliberate. It was a deliberate choice. You also, Benny, mm -hmm. uh, you make a, a curious admission uh, on, on the back of your one of the books. You say, in After Sunset, you yourself reveal a few poems you satire and might not necessarily observe correct sentence structures and grammar. Now since we're in the uh, multimedia library of the Alliance Francaise de Nairobi, as you well know, the French have a group of people called the Académie, and their job is to keep a sort of microscopic eye on the usage of the French language. And if a great poet 
uses French in a certain way, then it becomes grammatically acceptable. And people will cite Molière, Racine, and say, well, if Molière writes like that, uh, then it must be correct. You're saying that as an African writer, you can do whatever you like with the English language. Is that too extreme a conclusion? Um, that's how, well, let me explain that. There are three things that involve, um, that come into play when you are writing poetry. And one is the evolution of language. For example, um, academia can just come and say, hey, um, this is not what we really want to, you to do with our language, because it's a shame, of course, uh, it, 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 it's a language that mainly involves English and Swahili, of course, plus, uh, plus other, other, other words, broad words from either vernacular and, and all that. So the evolution of language, and that is something that we must appreciate in poetry. And why that has been put there is like a disclaimer that there is this aspect. And secondly... So you're allowing yourself to make mistakes. You're saying, oh, if I make mistakes, don't mind me, I'm just a poor Kenyan, is that it? No, that's not the case. The second thing is actually still goes back to the poetic license. And uh, the third thing is translation. When it comes to some of the points that are, especially in After Sunset and other points, also incorporate uh, Swahili language. So how you put in a Swahili uh, word in a line in English, it definitely affects the sentence structure. So you are not deliberately ruining the language. It's just that when this word comes into the sentence structure, it will distort like the exact way it should be in English. Benny, I'm interested to hear what a young person like you has to say about this whole issue of language. We go back to our greatest living writer in Bukiwa Diongo and this whole idea of we must not lose our mother tongues. If we lose our mother tongues, we lose something of ourselves. Now, you've just declared that you come from Central Province. May I assume that your mother tongue might be Kikuyu? Yeah, that's a good assumption, if I may say. Right, I'm going to keep that assumption and ask you, Benny, would you be able, would you be capable of writing a poem in Bikuyu? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm capable of writing in Bikuyu. And always, as a and always if, if, I, if I can permit myself to be rather unkind, there's the, the, there's the question behind the question, is why have you chosen, of your generation, an alien language in which to express yourself? Because it, you can't, in one fell swoop, be condemning English as the language of the colonial master, the language of the colonizer, and then not offering a substitute of your own, which ought to be your mother tongue. Um, what I would say is that we, there are two approaches to that, especially, and this cuts across literally, um, I mean the literally um, platform, or what do I call it, like all, like whatever involves literature. There's the traditional approach when it comes to language and there's the contemporary approach. And when we Kenyan writers or whoever are the African writers in general speak of the colonialists having dropped language to us and that we do not have to uphold that language, that we need to shun it off and write in our vernacular languages in our mother tongue, then uh, we are taking the traditional approach or we can also take the contemporary approach like what I have done by speaking English and communicating with this. And so the assumption is that English is the language which you have mastered because of the genre, poetry in particular with its in insistence on distillation, a poem is going to last, the sonnet is 14 lines, the haiku is maybe, I don't know, authority on papers, but it's short. You're talking about life and where we go from here in very short fashion. Shouldn't you start off by choosing a language which you profess to master? Well, I master all these languages. Um, of course, English um, come back to some extent, 
and also the low and the cold. However, I don't use them because of my audience. And like I mentioned, and also in the bio, like I'm an editor of Writer Space Africa, which is a continental group, and my poetry is not just read in Africa, it is read across the world. So I want you to wade into this debate, Benny. I want you to wade in and say something where after people have watched Mbogi Yama writers, they'll say, young poet, Benny Wanjohi says, maybe we should abandon our mother tongues. Too much of a statement to make. <laughs> well, you must find a middle crowd. That is what I would say. Okay. Yeah. For who? Because the reason why this particular chapter in our conversation is of the essence is because if somebody like you in your 30s hasn't given it the maximum thought process, then this debate will never go away because it will never move forward because it won't have a spokesman to suggest this middle ground. What is the middle ground? The middle ground is that we must appreciate where we come from, the mother tongue and all that. However, we must also appreciate, okay, that's our past. We must also appreciate the future and where we are going. So if we say, like, because the world is becoming a global village, and so we must really come to that point, you cannot just always write for your village, because if you write in your mother tongue, then it will just be your village, uh, village mates who are reading it, or it has then again to be translated for it to, to, to be read. So there must always be that language that you say, this is what I communicate, and mainly in consideration of the audience. I think it's time for another term. This volume is called After Sunset. And why not read to you, Benny, your title poem? Somewhere in the middle of a tea plantation, the sun turns red in the green horizon. Bidding goodbye to the busy day, children dart around as they play. Mothers bring in their full baskets of food bought from the markets. Men come in latest, in groups of three. Tired, they sit under the mugumo tree. A mother reprimands her children for not closing the door of the goat's pen. A young man whispers to a young lady, telling her that his house is ready. The men under the tree talk in low voices about their cruel employer and his vices. Smoke billows rise from the eleventh hut, a good sign that food is ready last. Men call, each to his thatched hut, to eat the cassava meal before night rest, as they give counsel to their eldest sons, because heritage is passed on to firstborns. In the bush, a leopard watches the village, planning when its attack it will stage. But the warriors saw its footprints, sharpened their spears and flints to stop it at its own tracks and save the herd. I said to myself, Benny, oh my goodness, nostalgia, old Africa, the village, the cassava, the millet, an Africa which has disappeared. Do you think that there is something that is quintessentially African, that one can find in our poetry and one should celebrate? Yeah, it's an unfair question, but because it's a question that I put to myself. What is the essence? What is quintessentially African? Because this is a village setting, leopards roaming about, but I doubt highly that you're going to take away yourself from the multimedia library and suddenly encounter your leopard on the way home. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, that is one way it, when, when we write African poetry days, there are several things that we are doing, but one major one is the heritage. That's why I was also speaking and saying that we must find a middle ground, appreciating the traditional. So this one way of 
preserving the culture, preserving the African dream that was there and that maybe we might not really find now. So generations to come and read such a poem, they will see that yes, the people who are living there were encountering leopards. The people who are living there, at least before you marry, you have to have a house ready. And exactly. Ready. But I, if, if you're a Kikuyu, I, there's a mythology that the Kikuyu used to have old people and when you got to a certain age and were about to die, then you were taken high up onto a cliff and um, left there to be eaten by the hyenas, by the crack of dawn. Something that you think we should continue to emulate as a way of behavior? Not really. So there are aspects of the past culture that we must get out of and there are some that we must preserve. Right. So, so you're, you're teaching a young uh, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, what value do you want him or her to sustain upon reading that poem? Because it's, you found it good enough, uh, enough of a success to name your entire anthology after it. So it must be some sort of coda of belief. So it still goes back to heritage and not really measuring like on one community. Like Africa uh, has many different communities, but there are some aspects that cut across. And that poem actually mentions some of the aspects that cut across. Right. We must draw to a close. Uh, I think we could go on forever, but um, nowadays attention spans are not that great unless we want to keep this show going on forever in future editions. I want to end by asking you how you envisage your growth as a poet. Because I note that in some of these, there are poems that are dealing with social concerns. It's probably right to say that Phases of Life has got to do with spirituality, but After Sunset is dealing with social concerns. So, for example, you talk about um, environmental issues. There's a poem here about how we must try very much to look after our wildlife, make sure that we don't kill our elephants. Do you write to order? Do you think if I write about conservation, it will have some traction in the present day? The word that I've put in my notes is topicality. Does topicality inform your choice? Yeah. Um, definitely, but it also depends on which audience. For example, conservation points, like um, some of the conservation points that I've written, I've submitted them to blogs that are followed by conservation and environmental conservationists. And also on other media, for example, that involve wildlife, especially in a Kenyan setting where we have wildlife as part of our tourism or as part of our heritage. So it actually goes back to what is your audience and what do you, which emotions do you want to evoke into them and what action do you want after they have read your poem for them to follow yes. So topical really comes in hand in hand. So is there, because I'm leading up into the process of writing a poem as, as we draw to a clear current effort to change our constitution, are these topics that exercise you? Because then I'm going to ask you, what is the process that leads you to decide I'm going to write a poem about this? and not that. Well, yeah, those are, actually, I have, uh, I think, two points on COVID, however, uh, they're not on, in this post. Um, and, and one, they are both on, on my Facebook page, what I said that Facebook is one of, like, where I have my audience, that's where I post, and so they are there. And so this societal, um, what I would call, things that come about, or happening actually really like um, influence like my poetry and sometimes I'm just um, there and thinking and observing something. Uh, the only thing that I really try to negate from for, for my own personal reasons is quality. Yeah, because my audience cuts across and in a Kenyan setting um, where we have politics mainly uh, based on tribal affiliation, I do not want to subject some of them like to uh, certain uh, ends of politics and others, yeah. So for, for that particular purpose, I've decided for politics, for me it is a no, but other topical 
uh, issues that happen in our country, that happen all around us, I write about them. The process, Benny. Every single literary forum that I go to or I've attended, writers are asked, how do they do what they do? Now, do you wake up, do you have a ritual? Do you wake up on a certain side of the bed? Do you comb your hair a certain way before you... What's the ritual to write in a poem? What's the ritual? What do you do every single time that's guaranteed? You throw salt over each shoulder before you start? I would say I'm a bit fragile when it comes to that, but there are some things that would always um, uh, more cut across all poetry, like they always happen with every poem. There are poems that I'll just sit down in five minutes, I've written a whole poem, and then I'll come back to editing. But there are poems where I'll just have an idea and can linger in my mind for, like, say, even two, three months before I put it down, depending on, like, what I would call the poetic muse, like, this is what I'm writing. So, some of the things that are bit, uh, basic when it comes to that, the idea is a key. And also to decide which uh, poetry type do I go for. And uh, that, that involves the craft and all, and all that. And how is the audience uh, pick it? And that's when now the editing comes in. Sometimes there are so many poems I've written and they have never uh, uh, seen the light of day. They, they are just mine to read and I keep them because I feel these are not for my audience. I ever have written them. Yeah. So we have spiritual phases of life. After sunset, social concerns. Where do you go from here, then? More of the same, more spiritual, more social topics, excluding politics. Is this what we can expect from you for the next decade? In the next decade, I'm looking into definitely I'll continue writing poetry. Um, also, have in mind a poetry foundation, and especially to spearhead poetry with the limelight. So that when it comes even to price, it's not saying that poetry is not no no specific poet has won this, especially like in a Kenyan setting. So that's what I'm looking in a poetry foundation, which will be basically on mentorship of poets, upcoming poets. Benny, I wish to establish a ritual for each of these discussions, which is to end each one with three questions. It's not exactly the Proust questionnaire which you may have heard, but uh, what's your favourite colour, what's your favourite word? My questions have to do about what well, you're here. You can take them in any order which you like. The three questions are, what do you read? When Why do you write? And is there a relationship between all three? So, um, what I read, I read called spiritual books, and I also read other, other books, literature books, and also, additionally to that, a lot of blog articles. That is something that, of course, like in this generation, you have to, uh, to do. But I don't just do because you have to do, I do because I want to gain knowledge. And um, when, I, when I read, I read mostly between 7 and 8 in the morning, that's when I get to, to the office. So before every other person comes to the office at 8 hours, that's time to myself to read. So I'm always like the Alice in the office and using that time to, to read, sometimes also in the evening. And also when I travel for holiday, I also carry a book with my uh, I, I, with me to, to read. And the third why do you write? Why I write? Um, I write to inspire, to speak up, to evoke emotions. And actually, that's what poetry is about. I write to someone, and uh, for example, an emotion of happiness, joy, maybe sometimes sadness, if it's a social concern that needs to be addressed. And in the hope of that, having, inspired, having evoked that emotion, a action will be taken by the reader. Benny Ranjohi, it's been a pleasure. I think it's time for us to acknowledge our audience. You can stand to do that. So, from the multimedia library of the Alliance Française de Merovia, à la prochaine.